you all are contributing to our research and we wanted a chance to share with you what um, we're actually doing. And we also wanted a chance to thank you for your help to do what we do. Um, basically, without all of you, um, or your family member who you come with or friend, um, we couldn't do any of the work we do here. So um, we want to first thank you and um, let you get a sense for what we're doing today. Um, we aren't going to be able to talk about everything we do and every disease we study, um, but I think uh, you'll get uh, to meet some of our scientists um, and physicians here who are part of the program, and hopefully that'll keep you coming back, and we're hoping to do this on an annual basis. So what I thought I'd do today is I'd start by showing you a video about um, what we do here at BRI, and then we'll get going with talking about um, having individual speakers talk about what, what they do here. One in every 20 Americans suffers from an autoimmune disease. Type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Crohn's disease, to name a few. Because many causes of autoimmune diseases are shared, people with an autoimmune disease are more likely to suffer from more than one. At Benaroya Research Institute at Virginia Mason, scientists aren't focused on eliminating one or two autoimmune diseases. They're collaborating to take on all 80, sharing research to find the common links that lead to the diseases, so even one breakthrough has a much larger impact. And BRI's discoveries are having an impact on people living with autoimmune diseases today, like me. I was diagnosed with MS in 2003. Uh, that was three months after my mom was diagnosed. Uh, my husband also has MS, as does his sister. So to say that we are living with MS in my family is a bit of an understatement. I was really frustrated before the clinical trial. Uh, I had tried a couple different injectable medications and I was having side effects that were not okay with me. And I was kind of at a loss as to what to do. I am so happy to be a part of this trial. It's a, it's a good fit, me being at BRI. They're helping me and yeah, I guess I'm helping them too. Molly Jo joined the repository here at BRI, uh, which provides samples for scientific study from patients. My name is Jerry Nepom. I'm the director of Benaroya Research Institute at Virginia Mason. Here at BRI, we're all about discovering causes and cures of autoimmune diseases. That means really understanding how the immune system works and applying that knowledge to prevent, to treat, and to eliminate these diseases. Obviously, when people already have a disease, it would be nice if we could cure the disease but the ultimate cure is to prevent the disease. I'm Carla Greenbaum. I direct the diabetes program at the Benaroya Research Institute. If we do find people who have two or more antibodies, unfortunately, that means that they will develop type 1 diabetes. And that means we want to give them the opportunity to be in a clinical trial to see if we can test a new therapy to delay or prevent the onset of type 1 diabetes. Being a scientist and a physician is, is, is pretty exciting for me as an individual. I'm Jane Buckner. I'm a scientist at the Benaroya Research Institute. I study autoimmune diseases in my laboratory and I treat patients with autoimmune diseases in the clinic at Virginia Mason. And the way we've treated those diseases in the past is to just attack the immune system and stop it from working. Obviously that's bad because we need our immune systems. So now what we've begun to understand is that there are pathways within the immune system that lead to disease. And so we target those immune pathways very specifically. The way I feel about my work at BRI is I'm enthusiastic. And, and I think people who meet me realize that my goal is to have the patients be enthusiastic about helping us with the research because it gives them hope. And the scientists have that enthusiasm that keeps them coming to work every day. Well, the ultimate goal is to basically eliminate disease, autoimmune disease. My name is Steve Ziegler, and I'm the director of the immunology program at the Benaroy Research Institute. So the way we do research at BRI is fairly unique within the, the scientific community in that we have basic researchers like myself interacting with, with doctors who, who see patients all the time. At our place, there's a complete integrated approach to how we do our science, where we go from basically bench to bedside back to bench and we integrate them in, in ways that no one else does. It's because of the common links between these autoimmune diseases that we formed the research programs at BRI, all built and designed around attacking the fundamental questions that link them all. We're where we are today because of the past research, 
And if I can help those living with autoimmune diseases, I'm happy to do what I can because we're all in this together. And, and so, so are we. we. overview of how we as a group work. I also like showing that. I was recently talking to another group and it was just me. And I like the fact that you can see that there's a large group of scientists who are engaged in this. Um, we actually have over um, 250 scientists working here at BRI. So um, you're going to see some of us today, but there's a lot of people in the background. So what we're going to be talking about today is really our work in translational research, which requires our uh, biorepository and registry. And I think I want to make the point that our registry participants are really the star of the show for us. Um, we have a whole series of registries where we ask um, patients with diseases as are written up there to help us by giving us blood samples, sometimes tissue samples. Um, and we also have a group of patients who we call our healthy controls. Those are donors who don't have autoimmune disease. Um, and uh, today, in my comments, I want to highlight that group because to us, they're incredibly important. We have a group of donors who are family members. They're very helpful for us to understand what may be carried among family members and, and lead to risk of autoimmunity in some people, but in other people, they're able to protect themselves. But we also ask a group of patients who not only don't have an autoimmune disease, but actually don't have family members with autoimmune disease to be in our studies. Those patients, those individuals are incredibly important to us. And I kind of think of them as incredible um, supporters of our work because they don't have a reason to do this other than to help other people. So um, we have this large registry. We have. Um, uh, we ask patients to give us information about themselves, as many of you know, and we also take their blood. Um, we have over 8,000 participants in our registry when we look across all of these registries. We had over um, 2,600 visits last year where people came in and gave us blood samples. And what I think is really important for you to know is that translates to over 6,000 experiments here at BRI or experiments done by collaborators who we're uh, provide samples to so they can ask the questions that they think are important in autoimmune disease. So there's a lot of work going on and this is a really important part to get to the answers. So how do we do this as a team approach? And you heard Steve Ziegler talking about our unique integration. We actually have um, a setup where we have patients come into our clinical research center um, and we have them interact with our clinical coordinators and um, research assistants. Um, that's integrated with some of our patients at the hospital. Um, and so we're able to get our registry participants in that way. Um, we're able to get the samples from those patients then directly to our scientists at BRI. And what do we get? Well, we have the um, uh, biologic samples that we get from patients and that we store here in this building. We have a group of people who are uniquely employed to handle those samples and to distribute them. We have the associated personal and family history of our patients in the registry, um, so we know a lot about them and their autoimmune disease, which helps us understand differences between patients. Um, and then we have clinical and diagnostic information, things like what was your set rate last week when we drew your blood? Or do you have an anti-CCP antibody or an anti-double-stranded DNA antibody? So that information can all go together so that as we look at the data we generate in the lab, we actually are doing it in an incredibly informed way. So I'm in a short talk today, but I told you I wanted to highlight the importance of our healthy controls. So this is showing a graph with some data that we collected. It doesn't really matter what we're measuring, but the red dots are patients with type 1 diabetes. And we did this assay, and there I have that data. <coughs> But what I want to point out to you is that data is meaningless to me without this data. And this data is showing us that they're in healthy subjects, they're able to inhibit their immune response to a level that's much better than in individuals with diabetes. If I didn't have healthy controls, I would never be able to discover this. So a place where we need those patients or subjects. This is another piece of data that my lab recently produced, and we were looking at rheumatoid arthritis patients. 
and we have identified the cells that we think are causing joint disease. Those are the ones on the right, the CIT peptides, and you can see that there's a breadth of different responses. And we compare those T cells to T cells that fight the flu, the ones that you create when we immunize you for influenza. And if you compare those T cells from flu or to the joint antigens in an RA patient, you say, well, they're not really different, so is this important? Well, so of course we look at controls at the same time. And you can tell now that healthy people and RA patients have the same response to the flu, but they don't to joints. And in fact, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you kind of respond to your joint like you do to the flu, but a healthy person wouldn't do that. So again, without that extra piece of data from a healthy subject, we don't know how to interpret this. Another thing that we're very interested in is trying to understand multiple autoimmune diseases. Many scientists focus on one disease, and that's what they do, and they try to understand it. But what we want to know is what's common between these diseases, and can they teach us things? So our scientists and our physicians interact together. So I thought I'd talk, show you two examples. So this is a study where we're looking again at a response in this case to IL-2. And the black subjects are, are healthy controls, always important. And what you can see is that the diabetic subjects and the patients with MS look the same. And there's something wrong with the way they respond to IL-2. But notably, lupus patients look just like healthy controls. This tells us that the way they respond to this is different, and if I'm gonna choose a treatment targeting IL-2, I'd probably wanna treat the diabetic and MS patients similarly, but lupus patients would probably need a different type of therapy. So this is another example where we're, doing a, we're looking at the B cells in these patients, and I've actually added in this uh, one of our rare diseases we study, relapsing polychondritis. And what you can see here is that the type 1 diabetics and the patients with relapsing polychondritis um, have a similar increase in this type of B cell. And now the MS patients look like the healthy controls. This is helpful because it lets us know that there's something unusual going on in B cells in people with type 1 diabetes and in patients with this rare disease, relapsing polychondritis. There's genes that are common between these diseases, so we can kind of tease this apart in terms of the genetics. And then if we find a therapy in a more common disease, like diabetes, that we would treat with a therapy such as B cell depletion, there's a drug called rituximab that has been effective in diabetes, it would then raise the question, should we go to patients with this very rare disease um, and treat them in a similar manner? So, Two points I wanted to make here. We need controls to understand our data, and I think by looking across autoimmune diseases and finding patterns that are common and not common, we can treat many of these diseases, even the rare ones, better. <clears throat> so that's my spiel for this morning. Um, again, I want to thank you all for uh, helping us in this process. And so today, for our update in science, we're going to feature um, three of the uh, people involved in our work. Dr. Mariko Kita, who's a member of our neurology department, who drives our multiple sclerosis research and our uh, registry is going to talk first. Um, she, was, she did her undergraduate work at Johns Hopkins. In fact, she and I crossed paths there when I was a medical student, although we never met, but we may have actually walked past each other at some point. Uh, she did her MD at, at Northwestern and, and then was trained at Penn and UCSF before she, in neurology before she came here, and she is a physician here at Virginia Mason. So I'm going to hand it over to Marie Fowler.